Hi, this is Chris Dixon. Welcome to the Ace Dixon Z YouTube channel. Um, today I'm here with Olaf from Polychain, our good friend Olaf. Um, we're both longtime uh, cryptocurrency enthusiasts. Um, maybe uh, if you don't mind, um, it, we'll just go back a little bit. Um, you were uh, employee one at Coinbase? Yes, that's back correct. Back in what, what year was that? 2013. Okay. And, uh, and I guess you got interested in crypto before that? Yeah, so yeah. I was in college when I got into Bitcoin, uh -huh. and I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Bitcoin in 2011. And what, and what first got you excited about it? Um, so um, when I first read about it, I thought there's no way this is possible to have a native internet money that isn't controlled by any sort of central party. Yeah. Uh, so I found it fascinating on its face. And just sort of technically Yeah, possible. but then once I dug yeah. into it, I kind of thought about the nth order implications, and you realize this is a huge deal. Yeah. Um, it means that for the first time you can have digital scarcity on the internet, and of course you could move to a global unified financial and monetary system um, that's outside the scope of any sort of sovereign state, political control, um, and is really um, opt-in by all the users. Yep. So the general idea was just really fascinating to me. and. Um, I really did right away sort of like buy as much Bitcoin as that, I could. But that was back when the, you know, when Bitcoin was kind of the dominant idea and everyone <laughs> thought the kind of main thing you could do with this kind of new architecture was digital money. <laughs> Since then, the, the kind of possibility space, at least to me, feels like it's expanded dramatically. Yes, it has. And, yeah. and so to me, the big moment was um, when Ethereum launched. Yep. Uh, for me, I started seeing a, a big like breakthrough in my head was when I realized that Ethereum wallets were actually more like browsers yeah. than, than bank accounts. Um, and I started seeing some stuff get built on Ethereum that people in Bitcoin had tried to do for a long time. In Bitcoin, you only have one asset, which is Bitcoins. People had tried to build other sorts of tokens or yeah. assets that would settle to the Bitcoin blockchain. And there were projects like MasterCoin, Counterparty. Uh, we that yeah, we funded uh, this project Lighthouse, or we helped oh, fund yeah. it. You know, oh, yeah. Um, and that was and basically decentralized crowdfunding. Yeah, it was crowdfunding on Bitcoin. And it was just very, very difficult. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin has decided, perhaps correctly, um, to make, um, sort of, to, to trade off um, the expressiveness of the programming language mm -hmm. for uh, increased security. So they have a very kind of weak yep. programming language. Very deliberate, though, um, which provides, I think, pr perhaps better security and yep. kind of, you know, kind of, it's a more conservative kind yep. of development plan yep. path. But as a result, it's very hard to build, like, crowdfunding. And I remember when Ethereum came out, it was, like, literally one of the, like 12, 20 line, you know, yep, pieces of code exactly. on the homepage. And that, this is you know, one thing I think people yeah. really underestimate um, how much the developer abstraction matters. Yeah. So it took Mike Kern something like eight months to yeah. build yeah. Lighthouse using Bitcoin scripting. The Ethereum ERC20 system, like you and I could practically yeah. do this on our cell phones now. I mean, it's, um, and it, that layer of abstraction um, opens up mm -hmm. use cases that I think I think people underestimate how big a deal it is to, to Well, you know, it's the same with all computing. Like, you could have done, um, you know, there were mobile phones that had GPS and cell phone connectivity mm -hmm. pre-iPhone, but, but the iPhone made it so the app developer didn't have to understand that any of that stuff worked, right? You could focus on recruiting drivers and yep. building, like, yep. a beautiful UI. And, and to me, like, I mean, obviously the iPhone, there's a bunch of great things about the iPhone and Android and what made smartphones take off, but a lot of it was that they figured out the right abstraction layer for the developers so that, so that you could get a million apps, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and, and a whole bunch of kind of creativity that happened uh, yep. as a result of and that. And I actually think we're gonna see the next wave of that now with WebAssembly yeah. or Wasm because there have been problems with the Ethereum yeah. uh, Solidity language. Huge security um, problems and there's not actually as much expressivity as people yeah. think there is. Yeah. It's still limited to Solidity. Yeah. Even, you know, the, even one other language was basically found to be yeah. totally insecure. So um, I think that you know these uh, VM systems moving towards um, a Wasm uh, compiler, and this is like Polkadot, Definity, eWasm, so like Ethereum two. Um, I think it's a really big deal. Because just, so just to explain to people, so Bitcoin uh, comes up with this new kind of architecture that that I think of as. I think it's frankly mischaracterized today as a ledger. I think of it as a computing platform. So what's the difference between a computer and a ledger? A ledger is more like a hard drive. A computer is a hard drive plus a processor. Yeah, yeah. And Bitcoin has a processor. It's just a processor that has a limited range. It's deliberately limited in the applications it can mm -hmm. run. Uh, and it runs, and the main application it runs is mm -hmm. the thing that moves Bitcoins around, right? Mm -hmm. Ethereum says, hey, let's take that processor and let's expand it a lot. But as you're saying, it does, it did it, 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 it they developed their own programming language, Solidity, which is kind of JavaScript-like but it's kind of eccentric. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
And just so people, people don't know, WASM, so that's WebAssembly, which is now baked into every browser. And so it's sort of, you know, there are now billions of, um, of computers that run WASM natively. Um, and it will soon become, it already is, and, and is going to continue to become the most dominant kind of runtime environment for software yep. in the world. Yep. And what that means is now that all the blockchains are supporting WASM, that means that all of these, these compilers that are built from other programming languages, um, you know, Python, Rust, whatever, pick your favorite language, you already have, you, you get to piggyback off of all of the tooling that's been built over the last 20 years for the other programming languages. So you make it a much more kind of, yep familiar experience to developers. And so um, instead of needing to learn Solidity, yeah. um, which is, again, this custom language, it's it's a pretty new language yeah. in the scheme of things, you can use, yeah, your off-the-shelf favorite um, programming language. You know, to me, this is a similar step function that we saw from Bitcoin scripting. Well, see, it's not just the programming language, then. It's also like, it's like, you know, the great thing about Python, it's not just like there's there's 10,000 GitHub projects, right? Yeah. You know, it's formal verification. So just yeah. as an example, like, why does it take a long time to release an Ethereum project today? Like, I think at least half the development time probably is security audits, yeah. right? And that's because, you know, you've got this really kind of this this new programming language. People don't fully understand it. Um, there aren't these kind of tools around it. Yeah, and you suddenly you switch not, to something like yeah. Python, and you've got just like 20 years of, yeah. you know, for whatever, 15 years of, uh, of, of incredible uh, tools that are built around that, that environment. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, to me, this is one way that we're building useful abstractions um, to make this even easier to yeah. ship like end user applications. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the big thing's happening now, so I guess kind of jumping forward. So I think you and I probably see it similarly. There was kind of the first era, which was Bitcoin, but it was sort of the main, the only thing really in that first era, one of the only things. Um, then there's sort of the Ethereum era, which is sort of takes this idea of digital money and expands it to blockchain computers, mm -hmm. right? And now I think what we're seeing over the next 12 months or so, maybe 12 to 24 months, is the kind of the wave three happening, right? Which is taking the ideas of Ethereum, um, upgrading the developer experience like you just discussed, um, very importantly, upgrading the scalability, yep. which means multiple things. It means more, um, pr it probably basically means what, what like we call in traditional venture capital, scale out, not scale up. So instead of, instead of getting scale by adding more, a, big, a beefier computer, you can get scale by adding more computers to the network, yep. right? Which lets you kind of expand linearly with the demand. Um, and that requires what's known as sharding or some sort of yep. parallelism that lets you run. And, and, and that's what a lot of these new projects or they're, they're doing better developer experience with things like WASM and just all the other tooling around it. Um, they're, they're building parallelism in from the start, right, as opposed to having to upgrade later. Um, and, um, and what else? I, I, I think a yeah. third one for me is they're often building the ability to upgrade the protocol into the protocol. Yep, yep. So, so the, kind I, of the, yeah. the governance of the protocol itself and also uh, the governance yeah. of the smart contracts. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. So, so to me, um, Bitcoin and Ethereum um, and maybe, you know, very much intentionally um, have not had formal systems to upgrade themselves. Yep. Um, and that's because it does open up a potential security threat to the system. If it can yep. upgrade, then who yep. controls that upgrade process? But if you can adequately design an upgrade process that um, is controlled by the same people that already control the consensus layer, um, you know, it's, it's an equivalent threat as baking a bad block or something like yep. that. Um, so to me, you know, the ability to say, actually, there's a better system, let's upgrade and move to that system in a coordinated yeah. manner, um, you know, I, I think that's really exciting. That's, that's the way I think of that is it's, there's always a trade-off between um, the security of the system and, the, and the, 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 the very promise of a blockchain computer to me is that it, it's making a commitment that the code will continue to run as designed. There's sort of game theoretic guarantees. And you want to, of course, that maintaining that commitment is very, very important. Yep. Um, but there's a trade-off because software also, as we know from you know, decades of experience, uh, A, has bugs and needs to be fixed, and B, um, benefits from, you know, from sort of iterative upgrade cycles, yeah. right? And yep. so how do you balance those two things? And yep. so Bitcoin Ethereum kind of took the extreme kind of conservative route, which said you, you, the only way to upgrade is to kind of get a whole bunch of people to just literally upgrade their software simultaneously, which led to all these kind of offline things, including yep. sort of famously the Bitcoin Civil War and then the Ethereum yeah. fork, which yep. was very contentious. And so they were kind of built in a way to be very conservative with yep. their governance method, exactly. I think of it as. Yep. And so how do you find the right balance and the people are experimenting and trying new uh, systems? Yep. To, to get to get a better balance, maybe yeah. that, that well, and, uh, so I think a big part of this is there are actors in the Bitcoin and Ethereum and other other crypto systems 
that um, are part of what defines like the reality of those systems. And so you, you could call these node operators in, in Bitcoin. Miners obviously have, have a role to play in it. In proof of stake protocols, it's very much the token holders who are, are staking. And we've seen really, really strong participation. So in a lot of these delegated proof of stake protocols, you see you know, 70, 80% of token holders participating in consensus. Yeah. Um, so they're already defining what is the, the latest block in the blockchain. They're already defining the rules of that uh, computer. So in my mind, you know, how can we say they're gonna, we're gonna use a, a decentralized mechanism to come to consensus about the computer state but we're, gonna, we're going to also say it's impossible to come to a decision about how to change the rules of the computer. Um, so I'm, I'm very skeptical that we can't achieve very secure on-chain governance. I think we can. And to me, it's a very big deal because if you get governance right, in theory, everything else should be a sort of waterfall down from that. Um, and you can do very exciting things that I think we haven't done. You know, I, I think a big problem for both Bitcoin and Ethereum has been funding of core protocol development. Yep. So application developers have found all sorts of ways to monetize. You can go raise a VC round, you can do a token sale. Yep. You know, there, there's lots of money sloshing around in general if you're building on top of these protocols. Uh, but Ethereum has this weird problem where there's probably 100x the number of developers building apps on top as there are building core protocol stuff for Ethereum. And so to me... Um, well, that has to do with the history of Ethereum, right? So there was, yep. a, there was a foundation which has a certain amount of money but there was never kind of a, a structure set there's up. There's no, yeah, yeah, there's no structure. And in, in reality- Set up to continuously fund yeah. the development. And right? in so reality, these, there these needs teams to be some sort of, a, basically yeah. like yeah. a tax system, yeah. where if I contribute to the core protocol and create all well, of this like value- Well, it's like what Zcash does, what they have inflation yeah. baked into the protocol, and some portion of that goes, goes to, to- Which is kind of, software sort of crude, because uh, yeah. their system is, you know, it, it's designed around one team. I, I don't think it's designed to last 100 years yeah. and its current implementation. In, in their defense, I don't think they do either. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, no, no, I, mean I think that they think of it as a, as a MVP to a better... Yeah, to a better yeah. system, yeah. And, and so in, in my mind, the ability for developers to contribute um, new protocol suggestions and basically add a build to them. Yeah. Um, so then I could say, if this gets merged in and this actually becomes the new version of the protocol, um, me and my development team are actually going to inflate a certain number of coins that are just going to be created. It's like dilution, basically, for the existing holders, and they're going to be rewarded to us. And because this is a long-term iterative game between all the token holders and the developers who are going to contribute code to the protocol, it's actually in the token holders' best interest to pay them and, and say, okay, we're going to pay you guys you know, what, what I accept as an Ethereum holder, like a 1% dilution yeah. to ship Ethereum 2? Absolutely, right? That, it, it's a no-brainer to sure. me. And so if you could create 1% of the Ethereum uh, uh, tokens, you know, and grant those to the development team, today that's like, what, $200 million? It's, it's, a, it's a large amount what of money. Do you right? What do you say to the skeptics who think that uh, proof of stake will, governance will uh, devolve into either like a plutocracy on one hand where the big, you know, the big investors or whatever, like, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. plutocracy, like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of control for their own interests. And then, or, uh, or alternatively are vulnerable to bribery attacks and other kinds of, you Yeah, know. so I, I just think that we have relatively at scale uh, proof of stake systems today. Um, yeah, this, you, this argument seemed better 12 months ago before yeah, Tezos the, well, and Yeah, that's my Cosmos. thing, is like, you see Tezos and Cosmos, it's like, if you can get away with these attacks, there are hundred million dollar bounties yeah, to go do the them. biggest bug bounties. And I, I'm just, history. yeah, I'm a big believer in, in economic incentives for these bug bounties. I mean, if you can attack Tezos and break consensus and get bad blocks through I haven't followed the Tezos stuff go closely. Do are there people, I'm sure there are people trying to attack it. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure there yeah. are. And, and I'm just like yeah. there's people trying to attack Bitcoin yeah. all the time, yeah. right? And these are highly adversarial environments. But in, in my view, um, proof of stake to me has a few features that I really like about it. So one, you have uh, node operator and miner type um, participants and token holders. And in the Bitcoin system, we've actually seen cases where um, these parties don't have the best interests um, in mind. Like there, there's not a perfect um, yep. um, overlap for their interests. Yep. And so in a way you could argue there's like a check and balance or something like that. But in a system like Tezos or Cosmos, those are the same people, yep. right? So the token holders are the validators. And I, I think that just means in general there's going to be a better alignment of interests uh, between the block yeah. producers and, and the token holders. Um, the second thing is that if you attack a proof of stake network, um, mitigation of the attack after it happens is significantly easier. So if, if you um, come in with you know 51% of the coins, and in, in most proof of stake yeah. it's actually 34% of the coins is enough to attack. Um, 
and you start doing bad things, right? Bad blocks and stuff like that. Um, the minority people here can really just hard fork the chain and delete your coins and yeah. keep going. However, the, the reason they can do that is because that um, attacker's validation um, was intra-protocols, like within the protocol, so you can delete their, their stuff and move forward. Um, if you do that with hardware and proof-of-work systems, um, you actually have to change the hashing algorithm for the entire proof-of-work chain and burn everything to the ground, like for the good guys and the bad guys, yeah. because you have to fork so that the hardware is now bad for everyone. And so you have to basically punish the good guys and the bad guys to mitigate a proof of work. For so in a back. proof of work system, to summarize that, in a proof of work system, the worst case scenario is you, your attack doesn't work. In a proof of stake system, the worst case scenario is you lose all of your, you not, not only your attack doesn't work, but you also lose your entire life savings yes. in that protocol. Uh, yeah, so it's exactly. a much more punitive uh, it's, it's, measure. It's, well, it's, 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 um, it's, it's disproportionately yeah. punitive to the bad guy yeah, yeah. Um, in proof of stake. And yeah, so uh, I, by the way, and so I'd add also the other thing about proof, I mean, besides, there's also like the energy use is not, oh, well, yeah, yeah, like yeah. it doesn't, you know, Bitcoin mining destroys all this, uses, wastes all this energy, it deliberately does, but it's still bad. Also very, for me, is a critical thing is, uh, you talk about like developer experience and user experience, uh, you just simply can't have uh, like sub-second transaction finality in a proof of work system, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so yep. Bitcoin, like you really need to wait you know, each block is 10 minutes, and mm -hmm. that has to do with the coordination among the network and the, and the network propagation latency and things. Um, but also, it's a probabilistic method, so you really have to wait probably 60 minutes, if not longer. Yep. And from a user experience point of view, you know, if I send you, and it's the same with Ethereum today, it's proof of work, you know, and you go, you, if you download Coinbase Wallet and you try to use some of these apps, there's a lot of really cool apps, it's early, but you got to wait 30 yep. seconds yep. To, for like, a, after you click a button, that's not a modern user experience. Yep. And the only way we're going to get to modern user experience is through these kind of proof of stake systems. They have all these kind yep. of different methods that, that, that get much faster transactions. So just, I think, a whole bunch yeah, of reasons why. I skip sharding. You can't, yep. you, no one I, that I've ever heard of knows how to do sharding in proof of work. Yeah, I, I mean, I, um, So parallel, so scaling, all these yeah. other things we're I mean, talking about require for the stake. There's a reason that every, you know, I, I think 2017 was a major year of fundraising, and 2019 is a major year of launches. And there's a reason that every blockchain that's launching today is mostly using proof I of mean, stake. with the exception yeah. of Grin and things like this, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But, I, but I those are all just simple uh, transactional. They don't have smart contracts. They don't have really yeah. scaling solutions. They yeah. A, a, a Grin is not, yeah. um, it is very much focused on private payments it, yeah. it, and, and scalable payments. It's not trying to open up a suite of new applications yeah. that were not possible with yeah. the older protocols, um, which to me is the really exciting thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's what is possible um, that, that we haven't seen happen yeah. today. Because even the Ethereum developers, you know, when they shipped the protocol in 2015, I don't think any of them could have conceived of the whole ICO wave. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, that was like 12, to 18 months away, um, and it was still hard to yeah. see that that was coming. No, I mean, to me, this is what makes computing interesting, right? Is, is there's this interplay? If you go look at the PC, the internet, smartphones. Um, I think we're going to see it with crypto. I think we're going to see it with VR in a couple this year and a couple years. Um, there's this interplay where you get the platforms get better. Like the, in this case, we're talking about layer one smart contract platforms, right? Which are the ones we're talking about that yep. are like coming out over the next 12 to 18 months. And those are kind of the equivalent of the Apple or two or the iPhone or whatever yep. in this world. Yep. But the, to, to me, and that's cool, that's great, and we're into that, right? But the really cool part is all of the crazy stuff that people, like no one imagined, like it's really mm -hmm. funny if you go back and look at the early like Apple II ads. So Apple II came out in 77. You know, PCs didn't really take off for six years, and for those like six year period, people were trying to figure out what do you do with these things. Yeah, and all the old yeah, ads yeah. are really funny. They always have like people at the kitchen table doing the recipes, and like yeah, computer yeah, yeah, companies yeah, yeah. didn't really know. But then the developers came along and invented word processing, spreadsheets, you know, all yeah. this other cool stuff. And so that, that to me is what's really like right now, we're seeing a little bit on the application side, but it's limited because the, the platforms, the layer one smart mm -hmm. contract platforms just aren't there. Yep. Right? So we well, can't, you can't really, I mean, we're seeing cool stuff. We'll talk about it today, like in DeFi, for example, the decentralized yep. finance. W where the maybe the the performance parameters are, are looser and things they don't need is the kind of kind of performance you need for other things. But what's really going to get exciting to me is that period of like yep. hopefully a year or two from now well, when we've got a great platform and then we just see this explosion of creativity. Yeah. Well, and the the big thing is people need to untether themselves from thinking only in terms of efficiency improvements of existing processes. So like early use cases for Bitcoin that people talked about a lot is basically cost savings of uh, remittance or um, cost savings yeah. of, of micropayments or something like that. 
Um, but that's really looking at existing use cases and applications, yeah. that, like a recipe book, yeah. and saying, oh, let's put this on the computer. Um, that's but how in, it always happens, though, by the way. Yeah, like, you it, look at early it, web, and exact, they, just, they took magazines, and they, or they put brochures, yeah. and they put them on the, on the web. And but that's just how people think. And then only, it took you took people 10 years to realize, wait, this is a two-way medium. Yeah, you there's do, all these. You generated content in YouTube and Facebook. And so what, and, what I really care about are what are going to be the native apps that yeah. are only possible with blockchains. Yeah. And uh, also, the, you know, the other thing is people are very t caught on the Web2 model. Yeah. Um, people are talking about daily active users, but of like financial products. It's this odd thing. So like, are you a daily active user of your mortgage, yeah, yeah. right? It's like the wrong framework. Yeah, it's just yeah, the wrong yeah, question, yeah. right? Um, but you know, to me, I, I think we well, need to- the reason to everyone was so focused on DAUs for Web2 was because the main business model was advertising yep. and that was exactly. driven, so it was a proxy for what the business model was, yep. right? But, yep. but if ultimately, if you have a business model that is not dependent on DAUs, that's not your main metric. Yeah, right? exactly. And so, it, so to me, I just think we're gonna see this um, iteration and explosion of um, basically you know, financial services and finance, but at the speed of open source software development, which is really, really fast. Um, and it's highly iterative and it's like a big shared um, you know, open code repository that people mm -hmm. are, are building on. So to me, the um, innovation here is going to be very, very fast. I mean, it, it already has been, but it, it will continue to be. And um, the thing I look forward to is what, what ha what, you know, what's going to happen that is sort of unimaginable today? Um, and sort of by definition, wasn't possible with the old yeah. architecture. I think, you know, to me, one of the, there are many kind of cool sci-fi things in crypto. I think one of the coolest things is the idea of, um, of uh, um, kind of code software that has an agency or sort of autonomous software. Yep. So you think about, you know, Maker today or yep. Compound and this idea that the code itself actually controls money and has business processes and logic. And it's not the code that's run by, it's not like code, you know, Google code controls stuff too, or PayPal does, but it's not really the code that does it, right? They're just mm -hmm. the instrument through which the management of that company executes their will. Here, the code itself actually is autonomous, right? And is no longer controlled. It's control this, is the, this is the sort of idea to me, the key idea of a blockchain is that the code continues to run um, as designed and it has sort of game theoretic guarantees that it will. Yep. Right? Yep. And that gives code this autonomous, uh, he's autonomous not in the sense of like AI autonomous, but in yep. the sense of like having agency well, and, 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 and self-control self and runs yeah. forever. Yeah. As we speak right now, these contracts on Ethereum are running and doing things and you know, yep. uh, distributing money or collecting I money or a, running other business logic. A, a rough but potentially useful analogy is thinking about um, the corporate structure. Mm. So like the idea of a corporation in theory is that it kind of runs forever. Yep. Um, and management can turn over and um, there's different types of capital formation to keep it funding and everything. Yep. And um, it's all through legal contracts in, ge in, in certain regions, right? So the, the corporation as a legal entity is always sort of registered with the state um, in a specific geographic region. Um, and it's all papered through legal contracts. But you know, could a, a system like that, that coordinates capital from many, many different people and outlives any of the individual people, um, could that move to a pure software system uh, using, as you said, sort of autonomous software? Um, instead of these legal contracts that are based in specific geographic regions, can it be sort of sovereign to the internet? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, these are the types of ideas that, it sounds crazy uh, today, uh, but when you, when you think about um, the sort of history of the corporation and, and the liquid stock markets that we have, um, you know, the, all of these concepts that, that we think of as that, you know, they've been around forever, they're really only about yeah. 100, 100 years old or something like that. To me, then, uh, an obvious question is why would you want that? And, and to me, the answers are, one, it, one is very important you mentioned before is open source. The fact that all this, all of these things we're discussing, they're all available uh, by definition. They have to be, if they're on Ethereum, like they have to be open. You can go read the GitHub code. Yep. If you can't do it yourself, you can have somebody else do it, right? So it's completely open. But then another very important feature is, is this, what we call compositionality or composability, um, is the idea that you can have one organization here and I can take that and I can build another one on top of it that references it. Yep. And, I, and I know I can do, and, and that's, the only reason I can do that is a couple things. One is it's software that can, you can actually like call the functions and things like that. And it's open source and so I can audit it and trust it. Um, but the third thing is because the code itself sort of exists on its own, I know I can build on top of it and like the code will continue to operate that way and there won't be some whimsical change in business strategy you know, by the yep. owners of the yep. code, right? Exactly. Which to me, like that, that like, it just, the, I guess, and this is informed partly through my experience in non-crypto tech, is just 
so much, there's so many issues created around platforms and around trusting platforms. And so you think about, you know, Zynga building on Facebook and like the hundreds of entrepreneurs who tried to build on top of Twitter. And just like, it would have been so cool if, to me, if Twitter, you know, were this sort of open protocol the way SMTP yep. email is. Yep. And you could have, you know, someone could build the, the you know, the superhuman of, of yep. Twitter as opposed to, you know, and the anti and people are complaining about spam on Twitter. Why aren't there, why isn't there a third party marketplace with spam filters the way there is with email clients, you know, or at least used to be. Um, and just like all the kind of cool stuff that you get, like, and you see in the open source world now where it's like Lego bricks and you're building these buildings out of the different bricks and every piece of code is a new Lego brick. And then you get this kind of combinatorial explosion of innovation. Yep. Well, and, and this is, I, I think a lot of people get um, caught up or confused on this. Decentralization is not an ideological thing. Yeah. It's an architecture to support that permissionless yeah. building. This is why the internet was so big. Yeah. Um, is is if, if there was like an intranet and Microsoft owned it, like Microsoft MSN yeah. and Microsoft Net back in the day, we would never have seen Amazon, Google, and, and all yeah. these companies grow like they have. Um, so to me, that that uh, decentralized architecture of all these systems, it's not like an ideological thing. It, it's really just an architecture yeah. that allows developers to build anything they want. And as yeah. you said, it's all sort of permanent. It, it's like if um, Every data structure on the entire internet was open yep. and, accept, and had an open API. We've, uh, seen, we've seen the power of the kind of comp composability in the open source world now. In the, in the traditional open source world, meaning like Linux and Apache and all this other stuff, you know, uh, that, that has been a phenomenal success. 90 plus percent of the software in the world today is open source. Every, you know, the bulk of the software in your iOS phone, the bulk of your software in your Android phone, every data center. Why is open source done so well? Because because you can remix it, right? You can take yep. the piece of code and you can do stuff with it. And it just gets this, you know, it starts off, if you go back to like when Linux came out in like whatever, early 90s, it, it was definitely worse than Windows. But yeah, then it just yeah, followed yeah. this much faster yeah. like innovation curve because of this, 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 the fact that you can compose these Lego bricks together. And you had just anyone in the world could come contribute, some smart person in some random place can see some bug and fix it. Just like all those effects. And now, but, but, but the problem was open source still depended on the goodwill or the financial interest of somebody to actually run the code. And, that, and that's, mm -hmm. of course, where AWS and Google Cloud stepped in. Like, we're going to actually run it, because open source was just code, right? Yep. And, and whereas blockchains are code instantiated, right? It's mm -hmm. code that's running. Yep. Um, and it doesn't depend on the kindness of strangers or capitalists yeah, to, yeah. To, to run it, and therefore can't be usurped in the same way. And it's just much more powerful because it keeps state and has data and, does, and has computing ability and just all yep. these other things that open source didn't have. So to me, it's like the best of those two worlds. It's like all the power of a modern computer and then the, and then the, the composability that made open source so successful. Yep, yep. And I, I do think that people underestimate um, just the scope of types of applications that will come out of this. Um, I think that, you know, this idea of a global unified internet money is um, one of the basics, it's, and it's a very, very big deal. Um, and if we do have these sort of um, decentralized autonomous um, corporations or something, yeah. they're going to be using the internet money in order to communicate um, among each other and create financial contracts yeah. and things like that. Um, but it's, it's, this is why this is such an exciting area, because uh, it just feels like the, the possibilities are sort of limitless. So what? Um, so let's talk about the, the kind of the state of the world right now too. So you know, uh, I think the New York Times just just talked about how you know they think the the crypto is over and there's all these sort of negative articles about it. Um, as, as usual. Yeah. Um, I've been reading these since I've been reading these for almost ten years. I've now. been reading these about the internet too for even longer and, yeah, and technology yeah, yeah. for longer. Um, but uh, but it has been there has been a price downturn. Uh, you know I don't know. Um, uh, some, maybe some of the excitement is down or something. I don't know. But so kind of, I guess, what I'm getting at is sort of where are we in the, in the life cycle of this kind of... Uh, yeah, so I, I do think that um, 2017 was a year of new financial instruments. And yeah. it was actually, I think a lot of people underestimate how, um, sm how small of an amount of money was available 2016 and before that yeah. for cryptocurrency and blockchains. Um, the whole universe was just pretty small. Um, you know, there was no billion dollar company anywhere. Um, it, it was really just a sort of niche -y thing. And for that reason, there just wasn't a lot of capital available. Um, now, the people that were very excited, though, about cryptocurrency were the people using cryptocurrency. But I do think that um, we saw a huge amount of funding and projects that had been in the works for many, many years had a funding moment. This is <coughs> Filecoin, Tezos, stuff yeah. like that. And so then, um, you know, I think 2019 is turning out to be the year of launches. Um, we've just seen these hugely ambitious projects 
um, actually get to across the finish line. And Cosmos is a great example, launched just about a month ago, um, and is sort of the first system we've ever seen that will allow cross-blockchain interaction. So we've always had these kind of siloed uh, logic and state in, say, Ethereum. Um, and now you could have smart contracts or, or, or tokens on Ethereum transfer like to other blockchains, potentially. It also gives um, you a scaling story because you can have, yeah. you can have mu multiple it's blockchains. A, it's almost kind of like sharding, right? Yeah. You, have, you have different blockchains that can sort of. I think we tokens. think of it as heterogeneous shards as opposed to homogeneous yep. shards. Yeah, so, yeah. Can, so each shard can have run its own language yeah. and its own environment. But. That's ex exactly right. And, and so the development momentum feels very strong to me, and we're going to see a lot of very, very exciting launches in 2019. However, I think that will be to very little fanfare. Um, it's kind of like Ethereum launched yep. in you know, the middle of crypto winter in 2015, and nobody cared. Um, you know, it's not like Ethereum launching was a, a well, it's not New like York the, Times And it's story. not like you're going to launch it and it's going to be an overnight success. You no. need to then, yeah. it's a, I think of these as a two-step go-to-market. So the first step is getting developers, right? And so, and you got to build that community and they got to build tools and you got to build like, you just think about all the stuff that we take for granted probably in the Ethereum world of like, you know, wallets and, yeah. you know, IDEs and debuggers and just like, you know, Etherscan and just like the whole list yeah, of things, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, caching, you know, alchemy style caching tools or whatever. There's a whole set of infrastructure, yeah. right? So that's got to get built. You've got to get people fired up. You've got to have like hackathons. You've got to, people got to learn the, you know, uh, do tutorial. Just there's a whole set of things yeah. that have to happen. And so even when you launch these, these new layer ones, I think it's probably... I don't know, at least 12 months, probably yeah. before you see like yep. higher quality applications coming out. Yep. And the other thing about, about the, as you know, with these, with these um, because the code is autonomous, because once you write it, it's out there, you really have to get the security right. Um, and some of that, imp those improvements will come through better programming languages and tools, but it also just takes longer. I, I hear people compare it to kind of hardware development versus software development. Like you can't, if you build faulty hardware, you have to recall it physically. Yeah, you build yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. faulty SaaS software, you can fix a few things and deploy. Um, and so it just takes a while. So, so I think, yeah, I do. I, I share your feeling that this will be a year of launches. However, it will be more of a developer kind of phenomenon than yeah. a end yeah, user I, phenomenon. I do think it'll take, yeah, 12 months, as yeah. you said, before we see a lot of the um, ways that these will be used in surprising uh, manners, yeah. right? I, I do think that Ethereum was uh, very exciting when it came out, but I really do think even the people that built Ethereum didn't couldn't properly predict exactly how it would be used. And these, these use cases are like 18 months down the line. It's yeah. not that far around the corner. Now, this is one thing I love about cryptocurrency is if you miss like three months, you're already behind yeah. on, on uh, the scope of, of kind of what is possible and, and, and what is happening. So when you talk about applications, so what do you, um, so like I think the thing that's working the most probably on Ethereum today is, is uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, let's, maybe let's talk a little bit about that and what you're excited about and then like other, other types of applications. Yeah. So I do think that one of the very big um, um, things being built on Ethereum that's exciting are stable coins. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly for me, it's crypto collateralized stable coins where the, the stable coin that's pegged to say the dollar or, but it really can be anything, any yeah. asset that's not endogenous to the blockchain. So it could be uh, Google stock or it could be uh, mm -hmm. S&P 500, it could be a bond, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, the backing for that value is a smart contract that's holding, you know, Ethereum compatible assets. Um, and this is like the MakerDAO system. Um, I think it's a really, really big deal because a lot of the use cases that people originally envisioned for cryptocurrencies related to financial services or payments have this significant problem, which is just the volatility. Yep. So even e-commerce with something as volatile as Bitcoin, you said like the one hour you wait until you have yep. to actually close and receive those Bitcoins. I mean, y margin on e-commerce often is pretty low, right? You might be getting four or five percent. Well, the volatility in an hour in Bitcoin can be more than yeah. that. So I, I do think that um, these stable coins are critical for other types of applications. And so the Augur prediction market, um, you know, other even just like token trading. You know, wh what is the base pair you're trading against in a decentralized exchange? Um, is it Ether against? Some I think other for any coin? I think also like you just think about lending, for example. Like yeah. people don't, you know, exactly. They, if your costs, if you're buying a house in dollars, you want your one, well, yeah. You want your stablecoin pegged to dollars. And, and then the stablecoin can actually then act as collateral in other types of, yeah. of use cases. So I, I do think that stablecoins are like I think this also critical the, building. I mean, block. the other thing about MakerDAO that's interesting is uh, just how it's a very interesting kind of economic structure for how they enforce the peg and how they kind of incentivize the ecosystem and that. And the fact that that runs in a smart contract, which holds a significant amount of money, is just a 
it's just a, a, a real, t I think to me, a testament to the, to the power of the Ethereum design yep. and the sort of what smart contract platforms can do. It's one of many examples, but, but uh, and but one, one. It, and it's gotten traction, like, and, and it's gotten more traction than I think people realize. As in, it's about two percent of all ether yeah. is is held in the MakerDAO contract, and now that's hard capped by the protocol. Um, so they could take off that cap. And when I say they, I mean actually the MKR holders yeah. who, who who vote on these changes. And so if they um, wanted to potentially massively increase the amount of Ether locked in that contract, they really could. Um, now, I do think it almost starts to create systemic risk at around, say, 5% of all Ether. Um, I mean, for the Ethereum protocol, for the MakerDAO protocol. So you don't want half of all Ether held in this thing. But in just sheer dollar terms, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars locked in this protocol that people are basically using to get a loan. Um, and so it's, it's, while these DeFi things are very, very hard to use, um, it, it's kind of a disaster from a UX perspective. You have to download all this software, you have to have Ether, um, you know, and you have to click through a million different things and have a mental model for what you're doing. And You have to you know. be, I mean, it's, just, it's a testament to how hardcore the enthusiasts yeah, are. That, yeah, <laughs> it, exactly. And, you know, I think a lot of them are um, arbitragers and, and folks like that that are just doing kind of profit-seeking behavior. But it's... Um, yeah, I, I mean, to me, we are seeing kind of the early success of some of these low-level stablecoin uh, uh, systems. And I think that stablecoins are going to be a critical um, part of the recipe for a lot of more abstracted, higher-level use cases. I think of it as uh, our friend Bology has a kind of framework I like, which is, you know, you think about, he, what he would say, I think, is that the, the idea that you buy a cup of coffee using a cryptocurrency is sort of the, one of the least interesting use cases. Um, and he has this kind of model where it's kind of U-shaped, where it's, on the one hand, there's about a billion and a half people that have smartphones but are, are unbanked, are not yep. part of the internet economy. And for those people, that's the, it's very interesting to have a digitally native currency, right? Um, and architecturally, it makes a lot of sense because the, one of the key features of cryptocurrency is it's a bearer instrument, meaning the recipient can verify that they got, they got paid using just sort of math and the internet and not having to rely on a bank or some third party and therefore doesn't need an ID and doesn't have, have fraud risk and everything else. So that's sort of the one end that we're, we're, where this stuff's so powerful. And then the other end is, is in the high, kind of the high end of the software developers. You now have programmable yep. money, and programmable loans, and program, uh, it's all these kind of cool new things you can do on the innovation side. Um, yep. and I, I think of it as like, what if, like here's a sort of a metaphor, but like, like the fact that, that photos are just a file format that you can send to people allowed people to invent Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. And if instead, if, you know, this is, this is again a metaphor, but like if instead you had to kind of get permission every time you sent a photo, yeah, if, yeah, if, it was yeah, a, yeah. if it was a service and not a file format, like there would have been way less innovation around kind of media over the last 20 years. Yep. And now, now what if money is a file format? It's just a string yeah, of bits. Exactly. It's just a string exactly. of bits. It's no longer a web service that's connected to PayPal or Visa or something and they can't take their money and screw it up or do whatever they want and it make you get permission and make yep. you get, you know, and like, and disenfranchise a billion and a half people and everything else, like, you know, now it's just bits and like, yep. what can you do? And it's a very powerful concept, yeah, right? It, it is. And I, I do think that, um, you know, the, the, an interesting feature of cryptocurrencies for me is that the people that become knowledgeable about cryptocurrencies, I would say about 95% of them or more uh, think it's a good idea once you become yeah. knowledgeable about it. And so to me, a, a lot of this is a, a, just an education process of like, how, how do we get more and more people to recognize um, why cryptocurrencies have this extremely unique value? It's the most misunderstood. I've, I feel like tech is often misunderstood, but mm -hmm. this is by far the most, at least that I've worked in, by far the most. The delta between the reality yeah, yeah. and the perception, and partly a self-inflicted wound yeah, oh because yeah. of the kind of early crypto movement, and it was you know, a lot of kind of political anarchist types got into it and things. But it's that's lingered, and it's just really misunderstood, and yeah. it's very rare. Yeah, I well, agree with you. I have this. I have this go over and over again, especially people that are technical. Um, you give them like the Ethereum white paper, or the Filecoin white paper, whatever you know, just a yeah. bunch of the Bitcoin white paper, and they come back and they're like, "Oh my God, this is totally different than what people described to me and what I read yeah, about." Yeah, exactly. Like, they just well, nothing like what it's they because read about. it's it's easy to pay attention to um, the, prices the bad and the actors and, the bad and, actors and, and, and the, yeah. prices and stuff when, in reality, the kind of fundamental. Uh, development, yeah, like you said, from Bitcoin to this more general computer to the more advanced applications that, again, like Filecoin being this low-level building block that's going to enable all sorts of, of, of new behaviors because, um, 
just thinking about Filecoin, like how am I supposed to build a, any sort of decentralized application if I can't um, do file storage, right? It's kind of this basic building block, but I can't build uh, Twitter the protocol or Uber the protocol to compete with the centralized web platform unless I have a decentralized file architecture underneath it, which today is not really possible. And so um, these low-level systems, it's, it's um, really remarkable, the rippling implications of, of what will become possible. And I do think that the number one barrier is just very simply education. Mm -hmm. um, this is an esoteric and complex um, area, and there's also a huge amount of smoke and mirrors, right? Yep. Um, I do think that there are um, have always been in, in the crypto space. It's, it's international and it's permissionless. So there's just a lot of crazy behaviors and um, crazy characters. And it's easy to focus on, on that stuff. Yep. That is, that's actually one of the good things about the price downturn is I think it's cleaned up a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and sort of put the focus back on innovation and technology. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that um, the sort of builders of all this stuff never really stop. Um, but they're also, um, you know, not who the media necessarily pays attention yeah. to. I think that um, the media tends to be a reflection of the investors, and the investors tend to be really short-sighted uh, yeah. and focus very much on month-to-month -month, uh, or even day-to-day -day type volatility. Yeah. So one interesting trend is uh, what we kind of what we call sort of vertically integrated applications, um, and uh, you know something we've been talking about. And it, and I think the way I think about it is sometimes when you don't have the full kind of um, uh, tech stack built out, um, sometimes to, for a project to kind of uh, get adoption, they need to build more themselves. And so like a good historical example is BlackBerry. They came up with, a, with an email smartphone in 2003, and at the time you just didn't have sort of a, a, a great smartphone platform like the iPhone, you didn't have great connectivity, you didn't have great backend, so they built the whole thing. They built the hardware, they built the software, they built the network, they built the back end, and they were able to kind of get, kind of what I think it was like pull the future forward. Yep. You know, eventually you could just do this by building an app on the iPhone, but like at the time you couldn't, so they had to build it all. And I think we're seeing some of that pattern now because we don't have all the, all the layers, you know, kind of at the, at the yep. um, ideal state now, particularly yep. like the love layer one smart contract platform we were talking about earlier, just we don't have kind of a great scalable everything else. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the yeah. old wisdom was sort of um, build a low level, yeah. um, you know, extensible protocol, and developers will come and build all the yeah. useful apps. And I think a great example of that was the 0x uh, uh, protocol system, which is like token trading on Ethereum yeah. using a smart contract. So um, they said, we're not going to own sort of the end user interface. We're going to build a low level system, and then different people are going to come build uh, web interfaces. Um, I think the, the newer generation of these smart contract developers we've seen say, we're going to build that low-level protocol, but we're also going to own the user interface and kind of build that full-stack experience. Yeah. Um, and that vertical integration, as you put it, I think is um, potentially going to be a catalyst for a lot of the stuff to move a little bit faster th than it has historically. Yeah. Um, and so there's um, the, the project Celo that's working on, first, a kind of low-level uh, stablecoin designed for payments and remittances. Um, as well as an Android kind of mobile first application designed for uh, folks that don't have access to traditional banking or financial yeah. services. And so by owning kind of both pieces, they can kind of iterate a bit faster and potentially yeah. understand the full scope of, of how the customer is, is yeah. using this platform. And, and provide kind of a modern um, user, user experience yep. that yep. you would hope for from a non kind of blockchain app, and they'll provide kind of a similar user experience, but then also I think have the kind of the, what I think is the modern crypto business model of, you know, they, they own some of the coins and they ultimately want to see the tokens appreciate um, and don't need to, and, and therefore are okay with other people, for example, starting to yep. build their own apps and yep. like, and supplanting their app. They don't need to control the end-to-end -end thing all the, all the way yep. you know, in the future because they have this business model that's aligned with the community it's this, it's instead of being fighting the community the way the social network of the model yeah. where like the more you give away yeah. the better you do yeah. for yourself which yeah. is obviously in web 2 it was kind of own everything yeah. Yeah. and fight but yeah. so it's so it's interesting because it start it, the model is sort of start web 2 like just to get the user experience right but then but then have the business model that's sort of web 3 and therefore yep. lets you have this great property of grow yep. the pie not fight over the pie yeah exactly right. um, okay so that's a uh, that's and then and then I guess one other thing um, we haven't covered is um, we talked about payments we talked about centralized finance um, 
we talked a little bit about like Filecoin and kind of what I would call incentivized infrastructure, yep. like kind of new infrastructure that has incentives built in. Um, uh, what are some of the other areas that, that you know, kind of application yeah. areas I mean, that you're excited about? Um, one thing with, with these crypto protocols is you can build markets for anything. Yep. And so um, anything today that's sort of a one-to-one -one service um, with, for example, in the case of Filecoin, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, whatever, Google Cloud, you can turn that into a competitive marketplace that sort of unifies all of these. And so while Filecoin builds this um, competitive spot market for file storage, you could have a similar thing for many of these kind of low-level computer resources. So you could do that for compute. Um, you could do that. Um, for I think AI data would be a very interesting one. Yeah. People it, are, genetic data, AI Federated data, learning, yeah. right? So then you could even like imagine. Where is the AI? Like it seems to be a critical question of the next 10 years is where does AI data live? Does it live in Google yeah, and Amazon exactly. servers? Or is it an open protocol where you know anyone can access it and there's some incentive model for mm -hmm. providing it and for getting it? One an interesting intersection is homomorphic encryption, mm -hmm. which allows you to um, train a machine learning system based on data that you actually don't know the plain text, so you only see the encrypted yep. version. It, it allows people to say, okay, I'm going to share the data from my Tesla or my smartphone with a major corporation and get paid for that data and that corporation will actually never learn the data but can still train the machine learning algorithm. Um, it's a bit abstract, it, yep. and, and I think it's early on, on that type of use case, but it's um, potentially you know, very transformative. I think also you, know, you could architect social networks, marketplaces like ride sharing, all of this stuff could be architected using these methods, and I think there would be benefits to all mm -hmm. sorts of community members, kind of stakeholders, including the drivers and riders, and so that's a separate, maybe a longer conversation. But yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I, th I do think the value accrual when these things succeed, go to the yeah. entire lar um, larger well, and, base. And, and they're governed by the larger base yeah, as exactly. opposed to by, you know, by uh, the, the, Instead of basically an extractive corporation that owns the platform and at the end of the day has some level of an adversarial relationship with its users. Yeah. I mean, it's um, today, yes, Facebook loves its users, but also it wants to put as many ads in front of the users as it possibly can, which um, actually disrupt the user experience. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an odd relationship, I think, that these yeah. Web2 platforms have with their user bases. I think another interesting area is, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of out of fashion at the moment, but I think it will come back as um, NFTs or, or um, you know, digital yep. goods. Um, it's always been, you know, there was a whole, I don't know if you, you were around for this, but the, uh, during when World of Warcraft was a big deal, there was this whole kind of um, underground market called oh, gold yeah. farming. So people wanted to instead of having to you know, earn your way up to level 70, you, people wanted to buy their way. And there was this whole thing where like, people would, there's this, these uh, off-game, yep. off uh, X-protocol yep. uh, websites where you could go do this, and it was a big deal. Um, and so a similar idea is to sort of take that and legitimate it and say, hey, you can earn you know, in a game or in a virtual world or in some other kind of experience, you know, what if there are goods that the user can actually own and take from one game to another and buy and sell them and you add economic incentives and you can make a living doing this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can actually own these things in a way that you can't today. Today you're really just kind of borrowing yep. them and the, these games will come and go and they'll, yep. all, you'll spend all this time earning stuff and it'll all then disappear or you'll forget about it. And this is just a much kind of more, it's much more like the offline world, like when you get stuff, you keep it. And, yep. and people, yeah. and people and it's we'll really popular in the offline world, and I think it'll yeah, be popular yeah, in the yeah. online world too. Oh, I mean, the <laughs> rippling implications of it are, are, are big too. So um, if you can own your avatar, and you yeah. can own the avatar sword and shield and everything, other, like we said earlier, everything here is interoperable. It's like an open yeah. API. So any developer can then build an expansion pack or a mod on the game. Yep. It, it turns like the modding community around various games into like a real economic system. Um, and so then you, you could actually imagine like in, in the longer term, um, it's almost like think about every like rupee you've ever earned in a game or every p bit of gold. Imagine if that was actually all unified among like almost every game, right? And yep. there were like secondary markets between um, one game and another game and you could, um, actually maybe bring your avatar from one game to another game. Um, there's just, you know, it, it's almost like turning the universe of video games into Minecraft, yeah. right? Um, obviously, that's a sort of um, far future, but no, I, I do think this, this open and interoperable uh, low-level systems do, do enable that type of behavior. Also, the other cool thing is that with, with the economic incentives, you suddenly, for example, you could imagine funding your game instead of going to Activision and asking them for money, yep. you can fund your game by pre-selling some of the goods. Yep. Um, you could have uh, third-party creators who earn living 
some person, you know, whatever with a smartphone is designing virtual goods and selling them and earning a living that yep. way. Well, and one um, of the most successful categories on Kickstarter is kickstarting video games. Yep. Um, because, you know, gamers are hardcore they, and they want to support independent developers. Now, imagine if you could take that from, I'm just going to buy your game to I'm actually going to invest in your game, yep. right? It's way more powerful. Yep. Um, and it aligns the, the interest between the gamers and, and the indie developers. So to me, yeah, th it could be a very big trend. Um, and we, we have seen some level of that. And I think one of the problems was, you know, when you can pre-sell these game items, you get this investor community rather than the gaming community yep. interested. Um, and so I do think it's important to, um, you know, make sure that it's not, um, it's like, it's, a, that it's people who actually want to play the game, yep. right, that are, that are sort of um, buying those game items. But I, I do think that, that interoperability of avatars and items and, and levels and stuff like that is, is a big deal. Yep. All right, awesome. Thanks, thanks Olaf. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris.